Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers pretextual stops, reasonable suspicion, and canine units, and is brought to us by Real World Police's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On October 3, 2018, officers Goodling and Glathorn of the Orlando Police Department pulled over graphic designer Kareem Spaulding while driving in Orlando, Florida for allegedly speeding and changing lanes in an intersection. Mr. Spaulding stopped his vehicle, and Officer Goodling approached on the driver's side while officer Glathorn approached on the passenger side. What's up, man? Roll your window up. Down. All, roll your window down. All the way down. All the way down. Roll all your windows down. Thank you, sir. You got a driver's license registration insurance for me? Hey, before you go reaching around, you have any guns in the car? Hey, turn the car off. Turn the car off. Turn the car off. No, 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 no. Turn the car off. Undo your seatbelt. Why are you reaching around so crazy like that? I asked you to do one thing, you start getting all fidgety, man. Step out of the car for me, bud. Go ahead and step out, bud. Yo, guys, listen, I don't consent to this. Listen, okay, step out, man. Listen. You're not in trouble right now. You're, you're just acting trouble. you're acting all funny. That's all. You're you're starting to reach for things, you're looking at me, you're nervous, you're starting to roll your window back up when I ask you to roll it guns. down. Oh, y'all got guns and everything. How you I do you see it? guns in my hand, sir? Guys, I'm recording. That's fine, we're recording, we're recording it too. Go ahead and go step out, okay? He asked you to step out. You're shaking. Step out. Step out of the car, sir. Step guys, out of the car for on, me. Man. Step out of the car for me, sir. Step out of the come car. On, man. Can't be Step serious. out of the car come for on. me. Step out, the Step out of the car. Step out of the car. You need to, yo, all you have to do is follow instructions. Relax. You're not in trouble, okay? Just relax. Turn around. You have anything on you? Guys, I don't. Do you have anything? Huh? Stop reaching. Do you have anything on you? I don't consent to searches, man. Okay. What is this? We're just patting you down. You're not in trouble right now, okay? Relax. I act- can't be serious. Y'all see this? You're acting funny, man. There's no reason for you to act like this. Is there anything illegal in the car, sir? Guys, I don't consent to search. Okay, listen. I'm not asking you to search a car right now. I'm asking if there's anything illegal in the vehicle. I don't answer questions. You don't answer Where's okay. your license, bud? Listen, you're not in any kind of trouble right now. We're trying to find out who you are. You're just shaking. You're acting funny. I want names and badge numbers. We'll, yeah, we'll we're, we're going to get that for you, bud. We'll get that for you. Hey, what's your name? Would you like to know why I stopped you so you understand why we're stopping you? Don't you think you should have did that when you... Yeah. You didn't give me a chance to because you started reaching around. You're making me nervous. I want to make sure that you go home safely and we go home safely. That's the key to this whole thing, okay? Oh, come on now. No, man. listen. The reason I stopped you is back on John Young in Washington or old John Young in Old Winter Garden. You switched lanes in the middle of the intersection. You cannot do that, number one. Number two, my vehicle's properly calibrated. I had you going 51 in a 35 mile an hour zone, all right? I don't want to stroke your tickets, bud. I really don't, all right? But if you're going to force me to do it, I have no problem doing it, all right? We're looking for narcotics. We're looking for firearms, all right? I'm not sitting here looking to stroke you for a speeding ticket and and the illegal lane change. I'm not looking to do that. You pulled me over because you're looking for narcotics. No. What's your first name? I pulled you over for your two traffic infractions, okay? That's it. What's your first name? Nice. But when you start acting weird, now I'm sitting there going, well, what's he have on him? Because that's nice. consistent with me. Officer Goodling informs Mr. Spaulding that although they pulled him over for two minor traffic offenses, what they are actually interested in is finding narcotics and firearms. In the 1973 case of United States versus Robinson, the Supreme Court concluded that a traffic violation arrest based on probable cause would not be invalidated by the fact that it was a pretext for a narcotics search. Building on that decision, the court clarified in the 1996 case of Wren versus United States that an officer's subjective motive does not invalidate objectively justifiable behavior under the Fourth Amendment, and that the constitutional reasonableness of traffic stops does not depend on the actual motivations of the individual officers involved. Because the officers had probable cause to believe that the traffic code had been violated, the court held that the stop was reasonable under the Fourth Amendment, despite any potential ulterior motive the officers had in making the stop, because, quote, subjective intentions play no role in ordinary probable cause Fourth Amendment analysis. It is important to note that the Wren decision also mentioned that, quote, the Constitution prohibits selective enforcement enforcement of the law based on considerations such as race. But the constitutional basis for objecting to intentionally discriminatory application of laws is the Equal Protection Clause, not the Fourth Amendment. However, discriminatory application, or selective enforcement claims under the Equal Protection Clause are exceptionally challenging to win due to the high standard of proof that is required. The essence of this type of claim, as the Supreme Court explained in the 1886 case of Yekwo versus Hopkins, is that, quote, though the law itself be fair on 
on its face and impartial in appearance, if it is applied and administered by public authority with an evil eye and an unequal hand, so as practically to make unjust and illegal discriminations between persons in similar circumstances, the denial of equal justice is still within the prohibition of the Constitution. While on its face, this statement seems to perfectly describe racial profiling and pretextual traffic stops, to succeed in a discriminatory application claim, an individual must show evidence that the challenged police action was both motivated by a discriminatory purpose and actually had a discriminatory effect. This means that an individual cannot just show evidence of unequal treatment, but they must also show evidence that the officers intended to discriminate. As the Supreme Court stated in the 1979 case of Personnel Administrator of Massachusetts v. Feeney, quote, Discriminatory purpose implies more than awareness of consequences. It implies that the decision-maker selected a particular course of action at least in part because of, not merely in spite of, its adverse effects upon an identifiable group. Given this high evidentiary bar, challenges to pretextual stops based on the Equal Protection Clause are rarely successful. And here, a court would almost certainly conclude that the officers were well within their authority to stop Mr. Spaulding, despite the fact that Officer Goodling actually admitted that the stop was pretextual. My registration is flying somewhere. Okay, okay. what's your first name? Got him? I'll get his yep. Go get it. What's your first name? Listen, you see my bag right there? You're about to be placed under arrest. Okay, what is your first name? Hey, you want to know my name is Kareem. Yeah, is That's all. That's it, man. Yeah. Okay, and what's your last name, Kareem? Spalding. Huh? Spalding. Where's your wallet? It's in the car right there in the bag. Are you okay if I grab it real quick? You might as well. I can't. I don't know. Is there any... There's nothing legal in the car, sir? I can't. I'm not asking questions. All right. Now, now you see where that makes us nervous? Because if somebody pulled me over and said, is there anything legal in the car? If there's... I'm going to say no, or I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say I'm not going to answer any questions. All right, no worries. Do we have a 95 dog available? I'm just going to, I'm, I'm being straight up with you, okay? I'm not going to sit here and try to pull fast ones on you. I got a canine coming. All right? I got I got a narcotics canine coming. So if there's anything illegal in the car and you want to be honest about it, we can go be honest about it. If not, it's not a big deal. You don't have to answer the questions. I'm not forcing you to answer the questions. All right? But in the meantime, till he gets here, now I got to start writing tickets. While continuing to detain Mr. Spaulding in handcuffs, Officer Goodling informs him that they have called a canine unit and they're waiting for it to arrive. In the 2005 case of Illinois v. Caballas, the Supreme Court held that officers did not violate the Fourth Amendment when a dog sniff was performed on the exterior of a citizen's vehicle while he was lawfully seized for a traffic violation because, quote, the use of a well-trained narcotics detection dog during a lawful traffic stop generally does not implicate legitimate privacy interests. Nonetheless, the court clarified in the 2015 case of Rodriguez versus United States that officers cannot prolong or add time to a traffic stop to have a canine sniff the vehicle, quote, absent the reasonable suspicion ordinarily demanded to justify detaining an individual. Rejecting an argument that an officer may, quote, incrementally prolong a stop to conduct a dog sniff so long as the officer is reasonably diligent in pursuing the traffic-related purpose of the stop, the court explained that because a dog sniff is a measure aimed at detecting evidence of ordinary criminal wrongdoing, it is not fairly characterized as part of the officer's officer's traffic mission, and therefore, independent reasonable suspicion was required to extend the stop. When it comes to deciding whether a traffic stop may be extended for a dog sniff, an individual's refusal to answer questions generally cannot be used as the basis for an officer's determination that reasonable suspicion exists. For instance, in the 1979 case of Michigan v. Filippo, the Supreme Court concluded that, quote, while a person may be briefly detained against his will on the basis of reasonable suspicion while pertinent questions are directed to him, the person stopped is not obliged to answer. Answers may not be compelled, and refusal to answer furnishes no basis for an arrest. It should be noted that the court recognized in a footnote to the 1983 case of Colander v. Lawson that, quote, In some circumstances, it is even conceivable that the mere fact that a suspect refuses to answer questions once detained, viewed in the context of the facts that gave rise to reasonable suspicion in the first place, would be enough to provide probable cause. However, the court immediately cautioned that, quote, A court confronted with such a claim would have to evaluate it carefully to make certain that the person arrested was not being penalized for the exercise of his right to refuse to answer. Here, the officers claim that Mr. Spaulding was making suspicious movements while still in the vehicle, despite the fact that their body camera footage shows no such movements. And Officer Goodling explicitly stated that Mr. Spaulding's invocation of his right to refuse to answer questions made him nervous, as there was no other basis on which the officers could make a claim of reasonable suspicion. A court would likely conclude that they could not prolong Mr. Spaulding's traffic stop for a dog sniff in this situation. Here, I'll stay with him. You can head back there and do it. 
There it is. Let's see ya. Kareem, listen. Before I have to go ripping the car apart to find what the dog's sitting on. All right. Do you want to tell me where it's at? I'm going to answer your question. Okay. Huh? Shake or anything, no, but it's like he's got all these like weird conversations, like city bus conversations. He's like got a picture of the like, like, That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm gonna read them. So I'm thinking sovereign citizen. You don't have to, you don't have to read them them. for that. Huh? Read them. No, we don't have to read them for that. But I would. He ain't gonna moved. talk to. It wouldn't be bad, huh? He ain't gonna say anything. I would just finish the ticket and. Call the day. Despite the fact that the narcotics detection dog alerted, the officers thoroughly searched the vehicle, including multiple bags and compartments, as well as the engine in the trunk, without finding any illicit substances. In general, a police officer has probable cause to search a vehicle when the facts available would cause a reasonably cautious individual to believe that contraband or evidence of a crime is present in the vehicle. In the 2013 case of Florida v. Harris, the Supreme Court held that a drug-sniffing dog's alert can constitute probable cause to search based on, quote, evidence of a dog's satisfaction satisfactory performance in a certification or training program. The court reasoned that, quote, if a bona fide organization has certified a dog after testing his reliability in a controlled setting, a court can presume that the dog's alert provides probable cause to search. The same is true, even in the absence of formal certification, if the dog has recently and successfully completed a training program that evaluated his proficiency in locating drugs. The court also stated that a criminal defendant must be provided with the opportunity to challenge the dog's reliability by contesting the adequacy of a certification or training program, offering evidence of the dog or handler's history in the field, or that the circumstances surrounding the particular alert rendered it untrustworthy, such as if the officer cued the dog, or if the team was working under unfamiliar conditions. Ultimately, the Harris Court determined that, quote, the question, similar to every inquiry into probable cause, is whether all the facts surrounding a dog's alert, viewed through the lens of common sense, would make a reasonably prudent person think that a search would reveal contraband or evidence of a crime. A sniff is up to snuff when it meets that test. In reaching this conclusion, the court expressly discounted the importance of a dog's field performance, and instead recognized controlled testing environments as offering a better measure of a dog's reliability. While a 2014 study of Polish police dogs found that in 1,219 experimental searching tests conducted in controlled testing environments, 87.7% of indications were correct and 5.3% were false, the accuracy rate drastically fell when searching outside and inside cars, dropping to 63.5% and 57.9% respectively. False positives can also be intentionally caused by the dog's handler. For instance, the handler might cue the dog to alert, or the dog may falsely alert out of a desire to please its handler, or receive the positive reinforcement it has come to associate with alerting. And so it is certainly possible that the dog's alert here was a false positive. However, given the legal framework surrounding drug-sniffing dogs and vehicle searches, absent any evidence that this particular dog was unreliable, a court would almost certainly conclude that probable cause existed to search the vehicle, even though no narcotics were discovered. Which one are you writing it for? Um, the lane change. Okay. Listen, I'm going to traffic ticket to you, okay? You are, you are being issued a uniform traffic citation. The officers issued Mr. Spalding a ticket for changing lanes in the intersection, as well as a warning for speeding, and allowed him to leave. Mr. Spalding ultimately pled no contest to the traffic offense and paid a $197 fine. Overall, officers Goodling and Glathorn get an F for conducting a pretextual stop of Mr. Spalding's vehicle, blatantly lying about Mr. Spalding's behavior in order to fabricate suspicion, and extending the traffic stop to bring in a narcotics detection dog without reasonable suspicion to do so. From the moment Officer Goodling approached the vehicle, he repeatedly made statements about Mr. Spalding's allegedly suspicious behavior, when all he did was reach for a piece of paper when asked for his license and registration, and start to roll up his window before rolling it down when Officer Goodling told him to roll his window up-down. 
Once Mr. Spalding was removed from his vehicle, the officers extended the traffic stop to call a canine unit based on his suspicious behavior and the fact that he invoked his right to refuse to answer their questions. It also seems that in order to justify waiting for the canine unit, the officers decided to write Mr. Spalding a ticket so that the canine unit would arrive before they completed the traffic-related purpose of the stop. It is clear that these officers had a basic understanding of the constitutional law surrounding traffic stops, but instead of following it, they manipulated it to violate Mr. Spaulding's rights. This sort of behavior is not only an appalling abuse of power, but it also serves to further alienate police officers from the communities they are meant to serve and whose rights they are meant to protect. That being said, the blame cannot be solely placed on these officers, as the current legal framework surrounding traffic stops allows for and often legitimizes conduct such as this. As long as an officer's subjective intentions cannot be considered when determining if an individual's rights were violated, encounters like this one will continue to occur. As for Mr. Spaulding, I cannot rightly assign a grade to someone who is simply a victim of a pretextual stop by officers looking for any reason to search his vehicle. Mr. Spaulding attempted to comply with the officer's orders, communicated that he did not consent to searches, and repeatedly invoked his right to remain silent. But taking these steps could not protect him from the officer's clear and openly stated agenda of searching for firearms and narcotics. It is obvious from his demeanor that this interaction was deeply distressing to Mr. Spaulding. And I have no doubt that it has forever tainted his view of police officers. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.